For several years now, I have been privileged to serve alongside with others in our community for the Critical Incident Management Team of the Londonderry Police Department, the CIMT as we are known, as a group of people like myself, civilians and police officers, who are being trained to come alongside of officers if they've experienced a very difficult scene of some sort. Most of the work takes place in peer-to-peer -peer counseling, but we've also been trained to come alongside officers if there's a, a group of officers who go to a particularly difficult scene. The hope through critical incident management is that we will lessen the realities of post-traumatic stress disorder. And we've been trained to help in that. But we also understand that for police officers, in fact, for any first responders, it's, it's not post, it's present traumatic stress disorder. They are dealing with this every moment of every day. At one of our most recent trainings, we had a person who presented to us the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder and what is known as moral injury. Moral injury. It's a different sort of uh, reality that first responders, in fact, I think all of us deal with. Moral injury, I define it this way. Moral injury is an attack or an assault on our sense of self, of who I am as a human. I look at the world around me and I see things that take place and it just cuts to the very heart of who I am as a person. We see the headlines in recent days. We feel the weight of so much that is taking place within our world, the flood of information that's coming into our lives on a daily basis. And we feel the weight of that. We get a strong sense that who I am as a person, who we are as humanity, is being insulted, injured by what is taking place within our world. A moral injury cries out for justice. We have a strong sense within ourselves that that is just not right. And so we cry out for justice. We say, let's make this right somehow. How can we make this right? And so as we look at the scripture today, I want us to come into our text today with an understanding that there is in the human heart a longing for justice. Whether we call it moral injury or not, we are a people who want to have our, our opportunity to state our case before the God of the universe and hear what he has to say. And so today, as we look at Luke chapter 23, I want us to understand that there are people in this text, they're looking for justice. So before we examine the scripture, take a moment and pray with me, please. Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In this series of teachings we're calling Final Words, Lasting Promises, last week we looked at the first word of Jesus as he spoke to whose, those who had crucified him and said, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. Today we look in Luke chapter 23 and we hear Jesus making a pronouncement, a decree over one of the criminals crucified next to him. And there's so much richness to this story. So as we work our way through uh, our text this morning, we're going to actually open up our Bibles, I hope and pray. If you, if you have a, a, a Bible in a book form, open it up. If you have a Bible on your iPad or on your phone or a device, uh, open up Luke chapter 23 as we work our way through. What we're going to discover here is that in each of the circumstances where Jesus was uh, on trial before Pilate and Herod, uh, when the criminals were on trial uh, before Jesus, we're going to hear people calling for justice. In our culture, when someone has broken a law, they're taken to court. They're a judge or a magistrate. Uh, makes a decision about whether they have broken the law and if they have, what penalty they will pay for having done that. 
So as I have looked at this text, I've, I see three courts, three courts where justice is being demanded, where justice is being talked about. The, the first court is the court of Pilate. So let's hear what scripture says about that. Then their whole assembly, the Jewish leaders, rose up and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to be, accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, oppos opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, You say so. Pilate then told the chief priests and the crowds, I find no grounds for charges against this man. But they kept insisting. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, where he started even to hear. Here's what we know about Pilate. Pilate was appointed as governor over the region of Judea in the southern part of Israel. As an appointment of the Roman emperor Tiberius, Pilate ruled over Judea from 26 AD to 36 AD. And Pilate, in his ruling over the Jewish nation, over the people in Judea in the southern part, he had found himself to be, well, in a no-win situation. First of all, he's been placed there. Somebody else has told him he's in control. And he has to exercise power uh, from Rome, which is a far, far long way away. And Pilate has to keep control over the people there in Jerusalem. There are a variety of different ways that they did that. Certainly, one of the most gruesome ways that they kept power over the people is that they crucified anyone who came up against the Roman government. Any person who in any way seemed to be going sideways with Rome was crucified. Pilate understands that when Jesus is brought before him, he's being brought by the religious leaders of his day, by the Jewish leaders of his day. And Pilate understands that um, he's in a very tight spot. You see, because in Pilate's background were circumstances where he had over, in a, in a heavy-handed way, had ruled over the Jews. That, that's in his permanent folder back in Rome. And so Pilate understands that, that he's in a tough spot right here. He's being asked by the Jewish leaders to condemn Jesus. And yet his past experience in working with the Jewish people has got him attention all the way in Rome. So Pilate understands he's in a tough spot. The Jewish leaders come before Pilate and they accuse Jesus of being one who has uh, diminished the financial responsibility of the Jewish people. He says that Jesus has told them that they, they shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar. Quite, quite honestly, Jesus never said that. He said, pay taxes to Caesar. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Caesar give to God what belongs to God. So the Jewish leaders, they, they seek to get away into Pilate's mind by saying he, he's cutting into the coffers. He's cutting into your revenue source because one of the main jobs of Pilate was to collect the taxes. Then he's, they go on to say that this Jesus accused him uh, of threatening Pilate's power. He says he's making himself out to be a king. So in Pilate's court, in the first court here in Luke chapter 23, Jesus is accused of being a person who Pilate should have reason to condemn. But he doesn't. He doesn't condemn him. In our text, we've heard this morning already, that he finds no grounds for charges against him. Two other times in Luke chapter 23, Pilate will say, I find no grounds for charging him. He concludes Jesus is innocent. But the voices of the crowd, the influences of the people, Push Pilate to a decision. As you read the text, he doesn't want to make. Back and forth, as Pilate is hearing from Jesus, he understands that Jesus really has been mostly in Galilee. And Galilee was not part of his jurisdiction, so he determines, I'll send you over to Herod and see what Herod has to say. This is Herod Antipas, 
This would be the second court in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 8, let's look at the text. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus did not answer him. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they had been enemies one of the other. Luke chapter 23 tells us of the second court. This is the court of Herod. Herod is the son of Herod the Great, the great builder of Jerusalem. He had ruled in Galilee until 39 AD. There, he has some knowledge of Jesus. He's curious about Jesus. He wants to see if Jesus would come and perform a miracle for him. So he must have heard that. Yes, the life of Jesus, miracles in his public ministry were over and over again. And so Herod hears the miracle worker. I can, I can have an audience with the miracle worker. But Jesus is silent. He says nothing to Herod. Herod concludes there's no charges against him, but as one who is in power, he turns him over to his soldiers. His soldiers mock him, put a royal robe upon his shoulders, send him back to Pilate. But they send him back with a verdict that he is innocent. He is innocent. So the first two courts, Luke describes for us, in Pilate's court, Jesus is innocent. In Herod's court, Jesus is innocent. And then the third court in Luke chapter 23. It's not what we would expect, because it's not like the splendid courtrooms and palace of Pilate and Herod. It's not a stone building. It's a place called the skull, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there, Golgotha is called that because there's a rock outcropping, and it looks like a human skull. Jesus is there. Jesus, the judge, is holding court. There's two criminals there, one on his left, one on his right. And one of the criminals brings a charge against Jesus. And the irony of what is taking place here is that Jesus, the one declared innocent by both Pilate and Herod, now hangs accused of a crime that he didn't commit, crucified between two criminals. One of the criminals says this to him. He began to yell, yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The charge brought by the criminal is understandable. He is staring death in the face. People who were crucified knew they were going to die. And so the first criminal begins to insult Jesus, begins to bring a charge against Jesus, the innocent one. Says to him, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Even in a place where justice is being rightly served to the criminal, not to Jesus, but to the criminal, the criminal has the audacity to say to Jesus, save me from my bad choices. Exercise your power, Jesus. Save us. <laughs> you say, how could the criminal do, criminal do such a thing? And yet I know my own heart. How many times have I said to Jesus, Jesus, save me from my bad choice. I am deserving of your judgment, but still I appeal to you for your grace. Save me from my bad choices. So the one criminal brought a charge against Jesus. The other criminal calls out for mercy. Again, from the text, Luke chapter 23, 
Verse 40. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God? For you are un undergoing the same punishment. We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first criminal brought a charge against Jesus, the innocent one. The second criminal cries out for mercy because he recognizes that he has committed a crime. He is guilty. He has been crucified because he deserved it. And something in the interchange between Jesus and the Roman soldiers Something in the interchange between Jesus and the other criminal hanging there at Golgotha, at the place of the school, has prompted the other criminal not to cry out with an insult, but to ask him for mercy. And Jesus, the judge, grants to him not only a pardon, but grants to him paradise. The king makes a promise. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now there's so much in the words that Jesus has said in this second of the final words and lasting promises of Jesus spoken from the cross. So let's um, pull back a little bit of what we understand and peel away some of what is taking place here. Jesus has been in the court of Pilate. Pilate has found him innocent. Jesus gets moved over to the court of Herod. Herod can find no charge against him, so he sends him back to Pilate. And Pilate will conclude, in, in his court, in Herod's court, and in my court, Jesus is innocent. But the voices of the people prevailed. The voices of the religious rulers, the scribes and the Pharisees prevailed. And their loud cries of crucify him, crucify him, influenced those in power to do injustice, to crucify an innocent man. And then in the court, the court of Jesus, where life really matters, Jesus hears the insult of the one criminal, says nothing to him, hears the plea for mercy from the second criminal and responds to him with this promise, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here's what I learned from people who are in power. Still, they can be influenced by the crowds. Still, they can be swayed by the voices of those around them. People in power, well, they use that power either for the good of people or the harm of people. Herod and Pilate, men in power, chose against Jesus. But the king who had the greatest power, Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, that was, that was his judicial bench for that moment. As he was there hanging upon the cross, the one with all power, hears the plea for mercy and speaks a word of promise to the criminal. He speaks to what my heart must hear. For all of the moral injury that I see taking place in the world around me, for all of the moral injury that, that I bring upon myself by the choices that I make, by all of the, all of the misuse of power that I see taking place in the world, by, by the misuse of my power that I see in my own heart, I hear Jesus still longing to forgive. Jesus still longing to extend grace. Jesus still wanting for his love to be poured out over any who will ask for it. He says to the criminal hanging there by his side, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that single word paradise could be part of a whole other teaching, 
But for our, our purposes today, let's understand this. That paradise, in Jesus' understanding of the afterlife, of the world beyond, was a place of rest, refreshment in a garden-like setting. Paradise is not heaven. Because paradise is a place of presence with Jesus, of being with him, a place of rest and refreshment, but it is a place of waiting. Because what the scripture teaches us, and hear this, understand this, the goal of being a follower of Jesus is not to get saved by Jesus, get forgiven by God, so that when I die, I go to heaven and to this eternal place where we do who knows what. Now the scriptures speak to us about a place called paradise. It's a place where we're in the presence of Jesus. We're enjoying a time of rest and refreshment, but it is not the place where the resurrection has taken place because the scripture teaches us this. The goal for the follower of Jesus is not just to get to heaven. The goal is the resurrection. The scripture describes Jesus as the first fruit of a resurrection, a, a life he was dead, crucified, buried, and raised to life. And so we live with the promise of this place called paradise, yes, but that's, that's an intermediate place. We live with a greater promise of a resurrection that will come someday. And in our resurrected bodies, we'll enjoy life in many ways, the life that we're having right here, right now, because we'll be in a recreated heavens and a recreated earth, a recreated people, resurrected people. That's the promise Jesus gives to us. So to the thief who asked for mercy, Jesus promises, you'll be with me, but there's even more awaiting you. Beyond the grave, beyond this intermediate state, is a resurrection that will come to all who trust in Christ. We hear in the court of Jesus a word of promise, a lasting promise to the thief who asked for mercy. So I'm going to invite you, understand this, that the one who has all power, Jesus, hanging upon a Roman cross, crucified even though he was innocent, will hear the plea from any person, including you, for mercy. And when he hears your voice, understanding, acknowledging your shortcomings, your sin, your rebellion, he offers to you his presence here beyond the grave and for eternally, eternity present with him in a resurrected life. That's the Jesus who is our judge. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that for myself and for any other person here in need of your mercy, that we would reach out to you. A simple request, remember me, remember me, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that your promise will be for our good and for your glory. And together, God's people said, amen, amen.